and welcome to Standard Precautions and Beyond, Conversations in Infection Prevention and Control, a podcast for the Alabama Regional Center for Infection Prevention and Control Training and Technical Assistance, or ARC-IPC. My name is Mina Nabavi, and I'm a program manager with the ARC-IPC at the University of Alabama at Birmingham's School of Public Health. There are many components of an effective infection prevention and control program. The IPC risk assessment is the starting point for creating an IPC program. A risk assessment is used to identify important infection control issues in your organization and determine goals to include in your infection prevention and control plan. Per the Joint Commission, an annual infection prevention and control risk assessment is required to define programmatic goals and objectives and to provide a framework for identifying gaps in services, safety, or data, as well as tracking progress in meeting specific goals. Today, we are joined by Janet Chance, Director of Infection Prevention, Accreditation, and Quality at Coleman Regional Medical Center, and Meredith Lutz, Chief Quality Officer at Medical West Hospital Authority, to discuss risk assessment and planning for infection prevention and control specialists. So thank you, Janet and Meredith, for being here today and taking time out of your schedule to talk with me. Well, Janet, I guess my first question is, what is an infection? prevention and control risk assessment and why is a risk assessment so important? Um, The risk assessment is um, extremely important because what it does is provide the uh, foundation uh, for the infection prevention program Um, and what uh, occurs is uh, risks are identified um, that are related to the care, treatment, and services provided and the environment of care that those uh, care, treatment, and services are provided in. Typically, this is done by a multidisciplinary team, uh, the Infection Prevention Qu- uh, Committee or a Quality Committee, um, and all areas of infection prevention are, are assessed uh, to identify um, what are the um, opportunities or the highest risk opportunities uh, that we need to focus on in regards to infection and prevention for the upcoming year. Uh, these are required Um, annually by Joint Commission and CMS as well. So it is the basic foundation for what you do in infection prevention, understanding that there are limited resources in infection prevention, so you can't do everything all at one time, so you have to focus on those high-risk items, and that's the whole beauty of doing the risk assessment. It helps you do that. And so I guess to follow up on that question, and I'll, I'll pass this one to you, Meredith, what are some of the critical steps in an IPC risk assessment? The IPC risk assessment, um, like Janet said, it's sort of the foundation, um, and it does work along with other risk assessments um, that are conducted. Um, it works along with the hazard vulnerability analysis that is done by the emergency management program. Um, and we also use um, tubercul- the tuberculosis risk assessment um, to assess the risk of tuberculosis in the community and in the facility, um, a sharp safety risk assessment. Um, to identify um, different pieces of of equipment that might need to be um, evaluated. Um, And then we also have um, our pre-construction risk assessments that um, we do to um, assess risk of um, any infections associated with uh, with construction. With each of these risk assessments, um, they all have um, sort of a similar model. Um, The first thing that you have to do is you have to collect information. Um, These risk assessments are not really opinion-based. They need to be based on facts and data. And so you have to have a good understanding of exactly where the facility or the community Um, is related to a specific topic. Um, And so you do have to spend some time doing some homework before you get started. And then like Janet said, working with a team is extremely important. 
um, because you need multiple perspectives for a, an infection control program risk assessment. Um, in addition to have your infection preventionist, you also are gonna need to have representation from the pharmacy, from the microbiology lab, um, antimicrobial stewardship champions, um, emergency management, um, staff education, different managers, and ideally even frontline staff who can work with the group to provide different perspectives um, and different opinions as you work through the process of the risk assessment. Um, and then ultimately, we have to make sure that when we are identifying um, what components we are going to assess, that we include both outcomes, um, so the infections or the exposures that might occur, but also that we look at processes because there are so many high-risk processes that if they break down, they can result in harm to patients or staff. That's exactly right. And some of those processes that are extremely important are things such as lack of hand hygiene, unsafe injection practices, uh, cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization practices, cleaning of the environment, um, the healthcare-associated infection trends that we're seeing, any communicable disease prevalence or incidence um, in your organization are very important to look at, and then just understanding your organization's operations, your current operations. I will add that as far as risk assessment goes. Another very important one is generally completed by your facilities manager, plan operations person, um, and that's the environment of care, which is, plays a big part in the infection prevention program overall. Well, and that's a nice segue into my next question, which is about elements or factors that an IPC specialist should consider in risk assessment. Things like environment, like you mentioned, the geographic location, the community or the population that is served. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Uh, sure. It's a very important to know, to identify, you know, the areas that you live in. What do you see? What are the, what are the highest uh, concerns? Is it weather issues that you um, experience a lot, such as severe thunderstorms, which could result in power outages, where you have to then manage uh, patients in the, um, in the healthcare environment without power? What does that look like? Without water, should you lose your water uh, source? What do you do for very critical things that you have to manage in the hospital, such as dialysis, for example? And that's a very big deal there. So you look at all those sorts of things. You know, we're on I-65. That's a corridor for a lot of traffic and, and the potential for um, incidents that will come through your organization, which is important. You look at the risks of infection, as we said, some of the environmental care issues, cleaning disinfection, that's important. Um, you're going to evaluate for outcomes procedures. We look at high-risk, high-volume, problem-prone procedures and focus on those to identify if we're at risk for infections for those. Uh, emergency management is very, very big, communicable diseases uh, for and, and being uh, prepared for any emergency, such as the one we've experienced for the past 21 months is very, very important. And then um, education and competency of your staff. So, you know, are, are we doing training and education for the staff that we need to? What's missing, right? Do we need to focus on things such as environment of care, the cleaning and disinfection, EVS staff, for example, are they up to speed and understand how to really clean a, a room for a discharged patient? Are we seeing any issues with that? There are lots of elements, lots of data that you can gather across the organization. So uh, many of these things that happen or that we look at are things that are actually required to by regulatory bodies. So there are certain infections we're required to report to the federal government, and that's important to track those. It's important to identify, do you have an issue with surgical site infections? Do you have an issue with catheter-associated urinary tract infections or a central line-associated bloodstream infections, ventilator-associated events, any of those sort of things that we're, we're, we're tracking, again, are those high-risk sort of patients or uh, folks that we need to really manage the care uh, in the environment that we provide the care in is the other big issue. So that's some of the elements that you need to consider uh, when you're performing that risk assessment. As Meredith said, so eloquently gathering the appropriate data, looking at as much data as you can get your hands on. Um, it does require a whole lot of front-end legwork to get that data together for the multidisciplinary team to evaluate to then uh, perform that risk assessment. 
And then looking at um, your geographic and your population, your community that you're serving, um, also can provide um, some insight into potential issues that you need to look at. You know, looking at what happens in your geographic location. Um, maybe if you're a tourist de destination, then you need to be a bit more focused on imported illnesses um, and diseases that maybe we don't see typically um, in most communities. I lived in Central Florida for um, quite some time and we saw Legionella every year related to snowbirds returning to their home um, and getting in the shower just because their water had been stagnant for six months. So you really can target um, some specific populations. Um, you also would want to look at um, things like how much homeless do you serve? Um, because there are gonna be unique needs and issues associated with uh, that population. Various religious groups that um, may be in your community can come into play, especially with um, issues such as use of blood, um, different types of treatments such as vaccines. And what um, populations does your hospital care for? There are specific populations that clearly um, have different standards and expectations um, because of increased risk. Patients who have cancer, um, HIV and AIDS. There are very specific things you uh, need to assess if you provide maternity care or you have a nursery. And of course, if you're taking care of pediatrics, then we have to worry about all of those communicable childhood illnesses that might just happen to ha uh, occur as the patient comes into the hospital. You know, when we discuss the environment, um, like Janet said, it's where you are, it's your facility, but it's also the broader community that you live in. I liked how you talked about how this is really a collaborative effort, right? You have to rely on colleagues in, in different divisions across the hospital um, to be able to perform this um, risk assessment. So Meredith, can you talk a bit about how risk is prioritized in IPC um, and specifically the risk hazard matrix? There isn't one perfect or um, broadly adopted um, hazard matrix. Um, there are quite a few. They do have similarities, but maybe have some different formulas um, to uh, create their prioritization. They all typically will look at um, what is the probability that event or that failure is going to occur? What is the impact that it would have on your organization? What is the level of harm that the staff or the patient would have? And then what is the facility readiness to look at? And you rank each of these topics and then use a formula to um, create a, a number and then use that to rank which are the priority issues. And that's why it's so important to get multiple voices in the process because when you start talking about impact on the organization, um, level of harm, readiness of change, you are going to get different perspectives depending on, on who you're talking to. Of course, we do have some things that are required by uh, regulation. Um, on the federal level, we have the quality reporting programs for Medicare and Medicaid payment programs, and most of that is managed through the National Healthcare Safety Network, or NHSN. Some states also have specific regulations. Some will mimic what the federal regulations are, while others have some uh, more unique requirements. So it's important to always make sure that um, you are including those things that are required by legislation. You would also want to look at anything that may be new um, a new metric or a new standard, new literature even, that's out. We don't typically get numerous major new standards from year to year, um, but over the years, things like the bloodborne pathogen standard, the transmission-based precautions. More recently, we've uh, been dealing with um, the COVID infection prevention standards. We need to include those 
um, as we are developing our list of what we are going to assess. We're also going to look at those things that may be um, high priority based on our governing system if we're part of a hospital system and our facility specific priorities based on our organization. So when we start looking at probability, um, there's a couple of ways that we look at probability. We look at high volume um, because there are a lot of those cases happening. There is an increased opportunity that a failure or an infection or an event may occur. That gives us more opportunity to intervene to make sure that we are doing things right. This does usually allow us to have a lot more data when there is high volume to help us with the analysis process, but it also can often lead us in multiple directions because it's not always a situation everything has the same source or the same drivers. We also look at problem prone issues. Um, these may be uh, based on outbreaks, um, comparing our rates or the number of events at our facility and comparing those to other hospitals or to the value-based purchasing targets. We really wanna see how big is the gap between what is observed at our facility and what is expected. We also want to look at low volume, high risk. This is where you may not do it very often, but a failure in the system could have um, severe or catastrophic effects. And so those also have to go into our matrix um, because we need to have good systems that will make sure that patients and staff are protected even though it's something that can be done very rarely. Some of these would be a single case of uh, Legionella acquired in the hospital um, or a single case of Aspergillus associated with construction in the hospital. And then we are going to look at other vulnerabilities so these may be um, new issues that have come up that have never been addressed at your facility. It could be something like the emergence of a, a new organism. Um, I remember the first time I saw a case of VRE or a case of CRE. Um, mutations in the normal uh, pathogens like H1N1 and, and the issues we had to deal with in 2009. Um, and even those totally new illnesses like Zika. We also have to look at threats. Maybe what's going on in your hospital. Are you planning to do construction? Are you creating a new service? With uh, COVID, um, you know, everybody likes to think that, well, we didn't anticipate this, but in reality, infection prevention has been discussing the likelihood of a pandemic occurring for the past two decades at least. So even looking at natural cycles of disease can provide us with insight. And then we're gonna look at the impact. Um, one, we're gonna look at the impact on the individual, but also the impact on the facility. The cost associated with the infection um, because for healthcare, um, we generally are not going to be paid additional money if a patient has a complication uh, to cover that additional cost. And so um, it's important that we be able to quantify what is the, the loss of resources associated with uh, preventable infections. We also have to look at um, the impact of payment programs. The Hospital Acquired Condition Program um, is a penalty program from Medicare. It can result in 1% loss of your Medicare payment for fee-for-service patients for a year based off of simply your infection rates. So that um, can have a huge impact um, on a hospital, especially uh, community-based hospitals that are standalone facilities. And then the effect on your reputation. Having a strain of bacteria named after you or an illness named after you is not something that you want to have in your reputation. Places where closure of services have occurred due to infections um, can be catastrophic and can also lead to the loss of both physicians and patients. 
Um, and then finally, we look at the readiness to change um, or what is our likelihood of success? Do we have information about what best practices are out there? What we can do to improve the system? Do we have the resources that are required? And is there an organizational commitment to um, pursue this change and to do the work that's necessary um, once we've identified it as a risk? Yes, I would I would definitely agree with every single bit of that. And it's a part of the risk hazard matrix also is um, making sure you're looking at the organization's preparedness right? Because we're looking at infection risk. How well prepared are we, right? So what's the probability this thing, this infection might occur? How bad would it be if it happened? And then how well prepared are we to deal with that? And that too contributes to what will rise to the top as far as something you you need to address for the organization. I will say that another very important point is the annual plan, this risk assessment and plan that happens uh, with this work is a living, breathing document because all through the year, you might add a new provider who provides a new service, performs different procedures in your facility. You're going to want to keep an eye on that. You might get a new piece of an equipment, such as robotics, uh, that you then need to look at, okay, so how are we going to use this equipment? What could the risk be to patients um, and staff? And, and what do we need to monitor to be sure this happens safely? So um, it is a living, breathing document. It's updated routinely um, through, throughout the, the year. As things happen, uh, just as the COVID happened, we had to address that and update our plans then. And uh, so that's another very important component of doing that risk assessment, knowing that it's going uh, to happen. You'll have to adjust that as you go along. And I think that segues nice into my next question, which is about, you know, once a risk assessment is completed, what's next? You know, and I think both of you have talked about it's not a one-time process, you know, done. Um, it's an annual review. It's a living document that you continue to edit. But can you also talk about how the results are communicated and how they're used in an organization? Sure. Um, so what happens once you've completed that risk assessment, right, then you begin to build your annual plan. Your annual plan consists of goals and objectives, right? So you want to have um, broad statements for each high-risk item that really kind of identifies what the over- overarching issue is uh, that you're going to be dealing with. Some examples might be improving hand hygiene, reducing the risk of surgical site infections, such as that. And then objectives, which are the measurable, quantifiable things that you will evaluate over a specific period of time, right? Uh, and so those need to be measurable, and they'll fall under the umbrella of each goal as you go along. But as far as approval process, generally what happens is this is developed by the multidisciplinary team, which could be the IP committee, a quality council, um, whatever team for your organization. All they're, they're not, There's not a, a one set way to do that, and every organization is um, built a little bit differently, so it may different, be different for each one. But generally what happens is it's approved through the Infection Prevention Committee, uh, which is typically a physician-shared committee um, And then it goes up through um, your quality council, if you have a quality council and an infection prevention committee that are separate, through the medical executive committee of your organization. And then ultimately, the the risk assessment and plan is approved by the board of directors uh, because they provide the resources and the funding for you to be able to to, um, operate that infection prevention, uh, the plan that you just built. So that's typically the flow of the risk assessment and plan. And then once that happens, the infection prevention committee goes about the work of implementing the annual plan that was approved by the board of directors. Uh, again, adjusting that plan as you go along could be very, very important as things as things are added. And so that's typically the flow of information of data typically is the same flow of information for your infection prevention risk assessment and plan. And it's really important to make sure that um, you're integrating infect, infection control and the infection control plan um, into the patient safety program and the patient safety plan. Um, the emergency management plan, the medication management plan, and the environment of care plans. They all really need to work together um, and have coordinated efforts to be most effective. And then once it's all done at the end, um, when you are preparing for the next year, 
Um, it's important to evaluate your risk assessment tool to determine if your tool did what it needed to do and was effective, um, whether you need to add a new category um, in the tool to better improve uh, the usefulness of that in the future. Well, I have one final question, and I guess this, I'm going to pose this to both of you, but um, what are some best practices or resources that you have used when performing a risk assessment that you think would be beneficial to IPC specialists? I would say that um, I think we all always start uh, with the CDC. Um, the amount of resources and data available um, from the CDC um, is tremendous, um, and you can sometimes get lost in it. Between HICPAC, NHSN, the outbreaks pages, um, the CDC can provide a lot of information in usable format. Um, of course, our professional organizations, uh, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control, um, or APIC. There are certain uh, state-based programs. Um, North Carolina, for example, has a SPICE, um, which has been in place for a long time and, and has a lot of resources. Patient safety organizations, um, such as ECRI or Premier, um, also offer tools. And CMS and uh, Health and Human Services actually offer some, some important tools. So um, with Health and Human Services and CMS, they do have the Medicare State Operations Manual and different appendices are available based on your setting that will uh, provide very specific guidance and, and topics. They also have their Surveyor Infection Control Worksheets um, which are a good place to start to identify where there may be some gaps. Um, more recently, they have also created a COVID-focused survey tool um, that can be used um, to look specifically at um, COVID. County health departments, state health departments um, do publish reports, typically on an annual basis. And so those can typically be found. Um, Health and Human Services also publishes a work plan that will let you know sort of what are the priorities going to be over the next several years um, to allow you to predict areas where you can go ahead and start working, anticipating uh, changes in standards. Um, and then there's also Healthy People and Healthy Community, which is done every 10 years, that can also provide uh, some insight into um, what HHS um, will be promoting um, in the community as well as in the hospitals. And then um, also OSHA for those organizations that are um, governed by OSHA. The OSHA regulations um, do provide some uh, information as well and sometimes will provide some specific um, information that will help you with your risk assessments. So there are uh, numerous uh, places where you can find information. And sometimes one of the best is simply looking to your peers and saying, hey, do you have a tool that has been useful um, or I'm having this problem, um, do you have a tool that you've used in the past? Um, because our peers within the infection prevention world uh, can be one of our most valuable resources. That's exactly right. And I would add to that uh, Joint Commission Best Practices for Infection Control Performance Improvements and Standards Compliance. Uh, is very, very helpful. Obtaining and ensuring that you are familiar with your state's rules and regs, right? Every state has the different rules and regs that you need to uh, take a look at, and they can be anything uh, to include the Alabama Department of Environmental Management. So the waste management, that's a big deal in, in hospitals. That's very important to be familiar with what the state requirements are, because that does affect a variety of things in your organization. Um, I just kind of checked off as Meredith was, was reviewing the items, and I had the exact same ones, and I think you just can't um, overstate the peers, getting in contact with peers who have had this experience, this concern or issue or whatever you're dealing with before, because someone has and has uh, identified an effective tool for their organization. So that is a, a very important component.
It certainly is of making sure you have the, the data that you need. And it can be overwhelming. You know, you just uh, you just filter through that based on uh, what you're needing. And it's very helpful, again, to, to prioritize, talk to your peers about what they're doing, and adopt some of those tools. There are so many things out there that have been published. There is no shortage of that whatsoever. And uh, generally, infection prevention folks, I will tell you, are very eager to share um, any of those folks in quality, patient safety. The goal is to have a safe environment for the care, for the care of our for our patients, visitors, and staff, and for them to to um, go home from their hospital stay um, healthy and well, uh, and without any sort of negative outcomes. So that's the goal of all this, ultimately, in the end, isn't it? So. Um, and kind of married at the hip are very important folks for infection prevention from uh, plan operations for the physical environment, employee health for, for employee management and making sure we have a protected staff when they come to work, um, environment, uh, environmental services for maintaining the cleanliness of the environment, which is uh, very, very important to keep our uh, burden of microorganisms down in the organization. So it's a, it's a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of work, and this infection prevention risk assessment and plan coordinates all that in a meaningful way uh, so that we all can work together to achieve the goals and objectives for the organization. I think that's a, a great wrap up, and I do appreciate the list that, that both of you have provided of potential resources. I hope that we can list some of these in the description of this podcast so some of our listeners may be able to access some of those materials. So I want to thank you both for being here today and joining us for this podcast. Um, and I hope that we can have you both back on the podcast again to discuss other aspects of IPC programs. Very good. Be happy to help in any way we can. Thank you very much. We've uh, definitely um, had some fun putting together this information. And like many others out there, um, we're always looking for um, resources to help us. So it's always a, a useful tool to have. Perfect. And thank you to our listeners. Please join us next time for another episode from Standard Precautions and Beyond, Conversations in Infection Prevention and Control. 